and it's time now to continue on our merry way as we count down to the number one player of this great football club. But before we do that, we just want to reminisce a little more. And to do that, four of the great names from North Melbourne and Arden Street. And I'm sure you'll welcome each to the couch. I speak first of Peter Chesnell. <laughs> Donald McDonald. Come on, Donald. Dennis Pagan. And Drew Petrie. Gentlemen, welcome. I think they're all on. Peter, you got us? Yes, I'm with Sandy, I'm with you. Excellent. Thank you. Yeah. Good to see you. Thank um, you. And we'll start with you because we're looking at probably going down the line, looking at the, some different eras. And you had a tough old start, didn't you, your first couple of years? It, it was a battle. Tell us about it. Um, yeah, that was in uh, 1968. Yep. Yeah, and uh, from, I was a Coral kid and, uh, of course, um, there was uh, the, a very important person come into our lives up in the ovens of Murray at that time, which was Ron Joseph, uh, who was, you know, one of the, he was the youngest uh, uh, secretary in in the, in the competition at that stage, and uh, we used to see quite a bit of Ron. Um, and then, of course, it wasn't long after that that um, the um, we we were then part, the ovens of Murray became part of what was the uh, the I think it was called we were then zoned to. Uh, North Melbourne, uh -huh. and of course Ron had already he'd been fossicking around and and bringing people into the club and so forth and so on. As he did fossick, he did. He? Yeah, my first game, Sandy, was against Footscray, and the great EJ Whitten was still playing, and and of course um, our coach was Keith McKenzie, um, Tony Trainer was our uh, president and so forth, and uh, and it was just uh, it was an amazing time. John John uh, Dugdale was our captain. And, um, and Peter Stewart and, and so forth and so on. We'd had a bad start to the year because we, things were looking fairly good for us and then uh, we had a fellow called Frank Good and Frank's here tonight and, yes. and Frank's a very special fellow. And Anyway, Frank uh, was doing great things at full forward and we went and played in South Australia. We played a game in South Australia pre-season and Frank was badly injured. He, he got knocked about. In those days, if you did a knee, he was finished uh, and he got knocked about badly. Um, Peter Stewart, who was a super player at centre half back, uh, also got injured, and all of a sudden, yeah, it was tough times for us. Yeah. But there was rumblings. There was things. We'll get to those. Yes. Yes, yeah. we will. I, I want to. I'm going to jump around a bit here. Yes. Uh, Donald, I want to ask you a question. Um, what was it like playing with Jimmy and Phil Cracker? Because you were you not the bodyguard? Oh, I don't know about the bodyguard. It's um. I oh, know, I remember when I was, I probably would have been playing, I think it was about 19, 1983, uh, probably playing about my 15th game. And I remember Barry Cable was our coach and um, Cabes came up to me and we were playing Essendon and it was like a top of the table clash. That stage, 83, we were going all right. We ended up being on top of the ladder at the end of the year and um, playing Essendon. And Essendon, their back line had like this half back line of um, Carey, Andrews and Duckworth. So, um, and I was... I was on Billy Duckworth playing as half of a flanker and uh, yeah, it was a very soft half back line. And I remember Cabe <laughs> said to me, he came up before the game, he goes, if anything happens to the crackers, you've got to run in there and look after them. And I'm thinking, oh, shit. <laughs> <laughs> so, uh, so anyway, I was recruited from Flemington, you know, and all my mates were from the commission flats, but that's where it ended with my bravery. I mean, I, uh, I'd, saw, I'd saw a lot of blokes throw punches, but uh, I wasn't too good at throwing them myself. Anyway, uh, anyway, so I'm having my own little blue with Billy Duckworth. The next minute, right in front of the Arden Street, the old grandstand there on the wing, there was a big roar and the ball was up the other end of the ground. I'm thinking, Jesus, I can't see anything going on down there. And I look around and here's Jimmy going toe-to-toe -to -toe with Ronnie Andrews. Oh. So, so I said... Jimmy, out of all the players, what would you take Ronnie Andrews? <laughs> yeah. So when anyway, I run down and uh, I sprinted in and I just thought, all right, I'm going to act a bit brave here. So I ran in and I pushed Ronnie Andrews and I said, you know, a bit of an expletive, get away from him, Ronnie. And Ronnie goes, piss off, he started it. <laughs> <laughs> so I think all the boys that um, played with Jimmy and it's funny, we went through that process. I mean, it was amazing how highly Jimmy was rated 
just for a little bloke, you know, just did the respect he had and, and the presence he had amongst all of our boys. And Phil was just a, a magical talent, you know, just a brilliant bloke. So, uh, yeah, I mean, they were just some special players in, a, in, a, in an era that we, uh, you know, we were wedged against. We were wedged in between two great eras, and our eras was obviously a, a bit ordinary. That's, that's why I'm up here. <laughs> <laughs> Well, one of the great eras was with Dennis Pagan. Dennis, welcome to you. Thanks, Andy. Yeah, Congratulations on the front bar too, by the way. I think you're very good. <laughs> Thanks, Andy. Um, we've heard from Ben and Arch uh, earlier tonight about all the people that, that make this club, but what part of the club or what parts of the club and, and the types of people that you would focus on when you're looking at North Melbourne and the football club that it has become? Because I know that you're passionate about it. Well, I just reckon the, the, um, the people that worked at North Melbourne were really special. And I reckon the greatest asset any organisation can have are the people who work there. And, you know, I saw um, on, the, on the video footage of some of the people who were there who really made the club. Maybe they're not uh, the sort of people that uh, professional football clubs um, would employ today, and, and they're worse off because of it, but just some wonderful people that worked at the club in those days, trainers, ladies making you know, soup and sandwiches and, you know, doctors and physios and, you know, property stewards. And you could sit, I could sit down here and name you probably 20 people who made the club. And we had a good team, but we had quality people off the ground and it just, just made us special for a long period of time, Sandy. And, you know, I'll, I'll never forget the contribution they made, and they weren't there for any other reason than wanting the team to be successful. So it was a great era in terms of all those uh, people that were at the football club. Uh, the 90s team were well known for playing very well on the field and didn't do a bad job off the field. Very good job off the very field. Very good off the field, yes, okay. My question is, how much did you know about those other activities? Well, one of the byproducts of going out and enjoying yourself was unity. And probably one of the biggest lessons, I reckon, football clubs, administrations, if you're all together on the same page, you've got some sort of uh, uh, opportunity. Once there's uh, fractures or disunity or Chinese whispers or bagging each other, you haven't got a chance. We were tight as a drum. And the thing about it, I knew what they were doing. And there were a lot of boys in the side. I can still remember uh, um, Wayne Kerry probably had shares in Fisherman's Friends and he used to have them in his mouth every time he'd come to training. <laughs> but, <laughs> but, the, but the best thing about it, we, uh, uh, when we come to train on Monday morning, they, you know, we served it up to them and we trained differently then. Um, and our, our guys just uh, really excelled on the track. You would have thought they had uh, three molded looks over the weekend instead of 47 stubbies, but they, <laughs> they trained superbly and you couldn't, I couldn't be critical and the results took care of itself on the weekend. Yeah. <laughs> Great attitude to have, yes. Drew, welcome back. Thanks, Andy. Um, can you tell me about that game? You, you played in Adelaide and came back and uh, yeah. the players' room, the coaches that burnt to the ground. Mm. I mean, how did you manage for two or three weeks after that? Yeah, it's, it probably flowed on longer than that, Sandy. The time, I remember we had to bounce between what was um, Eddie Had Stadium, I think it was called back then, and when it, then we moved back into Arden Street and the stench of smoke was pretty much lasted until they knocked the place down. So you think you'd be happy when, you play, when your facility burnt down when it looked like Arden Street, but at, um, at the same time, it was part of the fabric, a part of what we were, and it wasn't um, bright lights and, um, you know, shiny dumbbells. It was, it was fabric and people and much of, of what Dennis spoke about then. So it was, yeah, it was, um, it was, a, it was a sad sight despite that probably being the catalyst to building uh, what we see today. Yeah, it certainly is. Um, can I just stay with you for a moment? Because I think one of the most emotional times in this football club was the return to football of Jason McCartney. Tell us yeah. about that from a play, yep. fellow player. Yeah, it was. Um, and to, to hear many stories, the Spider Burton tells a great story of um, rooming with Jason when we were playing home games in Canberra and just the amount of time Jason would take to lather up um, with the moisturisers and the, the, the skins that he had to wear to, to help his, his wounds heal. And um, 
that night when he played, I didn't know it was his last game until after the game and I got caught up, I think, in the emotion of the night and um, gave him a hug after the game and, and um, kind of lingered around when it was time to cheer him off and I was a bit embarrassed, you know, to this day, the, the fact that I didn't sort of let one of those people that were one of his lifelong mates and, um, and um, you know, played with him for such a long time do it, but just the emotion and just knowing what he'd been through and hearing those stories, I, just, I kind of just wanted to um, savour up that moment myself and um, something I'll never forget and uh, yeah I'll, I'll look back on and um, it's a game that uh, to see someone's determination and will and pride in that jumper to get back he could have easily just retired um, you know and just the life's too hard I'm going to retire but to get back to being an AFL fitness standard was just an incredible effort. Yeah, it's a wonderful story. <laughs> Great to see him back. Donald, I'll just slip back to you for a moment. Um, people may not be aware, but there was a, a footy match in London called the Battle of Britain. Um, now, there was a rumour, was there not, that there was a, little, a pesky little Ford who may have been causing all the carnage. Would you like to elaborate? <coughs> yeah, it was, a, um, it was obviously a, uh, a well-remembered game. I think it's probably the only game I was remembered for. But, um, but it, was, uh, it was interesting because the... I don't know if you were a runner that, that trip, Dennis. Yeah, so that was the quality of the coaching group. You know, Dennis was our runner, so he probably got us fired up too much. But um, I think, um, yeah, just thinking back on, the, on that trip, you know, John Kennedy, um, we got beaten by over 100 points in a final against Melbourne, and uh, when the game came up, you know, Kanga, you know, was probably one of the great orators of all time, and he, uh, <clears throat> he got us really fired up. Me in particular, and it was probably another reason why I was fired up because I'd snuck out the day before and had a big night and a drink, uh, so I wasn't feeling too too uh, too well on the uh, on the actual day. And I remember doing the warm up and feeling a bit sus. And then uh, as we rolled into the game, David Reese Jones took a great mark, and uh, when he came down, I thought, oh well, look, it's an exhibition game. I might as well give him one because Reese has probably given me 100 of them over the journey. So I whacked him, and uh, being a big Deal that I am, I stood on the mark and just thought, oh, everything will be all right. And Reese just jumped up and punched me right in the mouth. So, uh, so then it started, and I, and I remember I was I was playing on a bloke called Ian Aiken, and uh, he's a bit of an athlete. And uh, for all the boys in the room that have been involved in a wrestle out in the ground, you're generally rooted straight after it. <laughs> anyway, this bloke that I was on decided he'd, you know, be the modern athlete that he was, that he'd run off to receive a kick from Reese. And I thought, mate, I'm not chasing you. So I tackled him off the ball. So anyway, he jumped up, he was a bit excited about what happened and started throwing punches at me. So anyway, I'll just do my best, you know, Johnny, Johnny Famishon and getting out of the way. And next thing you know, he's not there anymore. And um, Al Clarkson, who was an 18-year-old kid, probably on his first trip away, has just, just ran in and, and King hit him. And, uh, <laughs> and for a minute I was stunned. I thought, did I just see what I saw then, you know? And, and with that, it was just like charge of light brigade. The Carlton boys just wanted to kill him. And uh, um, Robert Walls gave him an instruction that he cannot walk off the ground. He had to be carried off. And um, I remember saying, to well, mate, you've got to come up here. Because, you know, Jimmy Buckley, they were all trying to get him off the ball. And so we were just fighting the whole day. And uh, the one thing, I'll never forget one thing that stood out with me with Al. It was a ball he sat under. And, uh, and it was like <laughs> 18 Carlton boys eyes lit up because Al was sitting under the ball and they came from everywhere and he took his eye, kept his eyes on the ball and took the mark and said, mate, you're going to be a good player. Yeah. And uh, so, uh, yeah, it was an unbelievable, uh, unbelievable experience. And there was one other thing that happened later on in the trip. We were, um, we were I was going up in the lift with, uh, with Al at the hotel and anyway, uh, Al and I are in the lift and the doors open and um, Ian Aitken walked in and his jaw was swollen. He's, Bandage and little Al's just sitting there, just shitting himself. And I said, Jesus, mate, what happened to you? <laughs> so it didn't go down too well. Game has changed a bit. Um, <laughs> um, just last quick, we could chat for hours, but just one more quickly, Peter. The change in the club from 70 to 74, could you see that change evolving? Yes, I could, Sandy, because uh, when, I, when I came back and I was very, I've always been very, very humble and very about the position that I'm in in this club. Um, 
I've, my heart's always been in this club. I love the club dearly. And, um, and I know that every time I run out on the ground that I, that, that I gave the fiercest I could possibly give. But while I was in all this, this unbelievable group of players and, uh, and you know, the habit, and a detractor had a go at me one night in a, in a, in a uh, sportsman's night. And, and he, sa he had a go at my coach, which irks me. You know, I, 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 I can fire up pretty quickly about Barassi. Um, so if someone wants to arc up about Barassi, well, then I can pee up here pretty quick. And, and so this bloke was a detractor and he, he wanted to go at Barass. And I found out later he was a Carlton man and that he was filthy on Barass leaving. And, and, you know, he was half drunk, of course, and there was a whole lot of other things. But then he then said to me that you would be the luckiest bloke that I've ever seen play. And I thought about it. I thought, well, should I flip off the stage and knock him out or what? Because he was one of those people, you know. But I held myself together. And I'm very proud about it today because I said to him all of a sudden, and because another fellow on the table fired up about it, and I said, no, stop, hang on. I think you're right. I am the luckiest bloke that's ever played this game. I was lucky enough to be on the ground when you see Keith Gregg streaking past his blonde hair streaking out the back. And I hear the one umpire, Kevin Smith, blow the whistle, controlling a game. I was lucky because I was out there. I was lucky when I stood in front of Ronald Dale Barassi and you people were sitting out there, you didn't know what he was saying to us. I was lucky because I was there. And I was lucky to be able to throw myself across a boot every now and again to make myself make sure that I got in the game again next week so I could be in with Blight and Greg and Cable and, and Henshaw and all the boys from, the, from uh, uh, the Ovens and Murray at that time. And there was five of us along with Frank Gumbleton oh, yeah. and Gary Cowton. You know, Cowton, they said about Cowton, you know, they talked about now about the new basketballers and all that. We had a basketballer that was state, he was a, a state basketballer. You know, he got named as, you know, the, 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 the mad, um, what they call him, crazy the horse. crazy horse. Of course he was crazy. It was crazy about getting the ball and playing in this team under this unbelievable man. And we had Alan Aylett, Barry Cheatley, and not forgetting their women, the women that backed those people. We knew what was happening at North Melbourne. We had to win because the power of what was going on around us had to bring something out. And, and that power is happening again. And it's going to continue on and continue on in this club. They will never, ever knock us down. Well said. Great way to finish. Passionate about it. Would you please thank Peter Chisnell, Donald McDonald, Dennis Pagan and Drew Petrie. Thank you boys very much.